Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. 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 The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, a lovely and powerful passage from Isaiah 61. However, it doesn't really have any substance in Luke 4 until Jesus boldly proclaims these words in verse 21. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In making this proclamation, Jesus has accomplished a couple of things. First, he announces the beginning of his ministry. For prior to this moment... In Luke, do you remember that one thing where he was born in a manger? What's that thing? Uh, Christmas, that's right. Spoke to his parents rather awkwardly as a kid in Jerusalem. Was baptized by John the Baptist and then tempted for 40 days in the wilderness. So with these words, he begins a journey of salvation and resurrection that would transform those who followed him at that time, as well as the millions and billions that would come after the Easter story. Secondly, with these words, Jesus is firmly announcing his calling. In other words, this is what Jesus is going to do. He is going to bring good news to the poor. He is going to proclaim release to the captives. He is going to recover sight to the blind. He is going to let the oppressed go free, and he is going to proclaim the Lord's favor. This is what Jesus the Christ is going to do. He is going to fulfill these words and so much more, especially what Isaiah 61 reads. And I would encourage you, if you want to read Isaiah 61, please do so. But even start with Isaiah 60, and then you can go all the way through 62. There is a whole lot of things that God is going to do. God is going to bring good news of deliverance in those passages. God is going to bring vindication and salvation to Zion. God is going to gather dispersed into a holy nation. This is what God is going to do. Yet the more I study these words from Luke 4 or Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. Through other people, when I read all of these different commentaries, too often, conservative, liberal, and everyone else in between theologians look upon these words as their personal calling. While it is a good goal to strive for, I, myself, can never accomplish what Jesus has done, especially in the area of salvation and resurrection. I, I really struggle with that. I'm pretty sure I would be stuck in that tomb. Hey, let me out! However, the more I pray and ponder about Jesus' use of these words and our desire to do something, I wonder if it feeds into our desire to be right. Now, why not? Being right feels good. It means that we have chosen the right path that seems correct for us. However, when we start screaming that others are wrong, does it still feel good? Perhaps. Does it make us more right by putting others down? Is it right for us then to label people whose views are different than our own? Suddenly being right is not about answering a call. It is all about power. And we do, and we can see all this through the Gospel of Luke, where there are people who are shouting, You are wrong, and I am right, especially chapter 23, verses 20 and 21, where it says, Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, answered them again, 
But they kept shouting these words, Crucify! Crucify him! These people thought they were right. But in their shouting, there was no one who was able to hear. For in that shouting, there was an innocent man who was tortured, humiliated, and condemned to death on the cross. That had to be right, right? And when we shout and scream in our rightness, we forget about what is most important. Our foundation in the one who sets us free by grace. It is not about being right. In our faith, our living means about being righteous in, with, and for our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, first, where we are called to explore the height and the depth and the width of this amazing relationship we have with our Creator. And from there, we can follow how God fulfills Isaiah 61 or Luke 4, depending on your, if you're excited about Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic. But let me put it to you another way. So if you are ready to start on a path that seems to be correct, where you are answering God's call, start at the beginning of the trail with an amazing trail guide, hearing these words from a psalm that most of you are probably very familiar with. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. So in conclusion, I ask you this, who here of you are ready to be in righteousness in, with, and for God? For if you are today with you, this scripture will be fulfilled in your hearing, not in our screaming, maybe in silence. Amen.